The Art of Love by Ovid. Ovid, a famous ancient Roman poet, penned a three-book instructional elegy series titled The Art of Love, which is also known as The Art of Love. In the year 2 AD, it was written. The purpose of writing book one of the Ars Amatoria was to teach a man how to find a woman. Ovid demonstrates how to maintain her in the second book. The third book, which was written two years after the publication of the first two books, offers women guidance on how to win and keep the love of a man. The book is titled I Have Just Armed the Greeks Against the Amazons, now, Penthesilia, it remains for me to arm thee against the Greeks. I have just armed the Greeks against the Amazons, now, Penthesilia, it remains for me to arm thee against the Greeks. Content The first two books in the series are geared toward male readers and include chapters that discuss issues such as not forgetting her birthday, letting her miss you, but not for long, and not asking about her age. The third offers similar guidance to women, some of the topics covered in this section include making up, but in private, being aware of fraudulent partners, and testing young and older lovers. Even though the book wasn't completed until approximately the year 2 AD, the majority of the counsel he offers is timeless and may be used in any era. The apparent brilliance of his actions frequently masks a deeper meaning that lies under the surface. Ovid, the classically educated con artist, refers to the tale of the rape of the Sabine women in connection with the discovery that the theater is an excellent place to meet girls, for example. It has been argued that this paragraph marks a significant attempt to rethink interactions between men and women in Roman society. It advocates a move away from paradigms of coercion and possession, towards conceptions of mutual fulfillment, and this line is used as evidence for this argument. However, even scholars are confused by the seeming brilliance of the surface, paradoxically, Ovid consequently tended in the 20th century to be underrated as lacking in seriousness. The typical events and cliches associated with the topic are addressed in a manner that is intended to be entertaining, using specifics from Greek mythology, everyday Roman life, and the general experience of humans everywhere. Ovid compares love to military service, implying that a man must exhibit the utmost degree of obedience to the woman he loves. He recommends to women that they incite false jealousy in their partners so that their partners do not become careless as a result of complacency. It is possible that as a result, a slave should be taught to stop the tryst between the lovers by yelling primus, which means we are lost. Which would force the young couple to take refuge in a closet out of terror. The tension that is implied by this uncommitted tone is evocative of a flirt, and in reality, the semi-serious, semi-ironic style is excellent for Ovid's subject matter because it allows for both irony and seriousness. It is remarkable that throughout all of his sardonic dialogue, Ovid never descends into risque or sexually explicit language. Naturally, embarrassing topics can never be altogether excluded, because preesipu nostrum est, quat pudet, in quit, opus, which translates to what blushes. Is our unique business here, says that what brings a blush can never be completely excluded. Again, form and content intersect in a way that is subtly inventive in this regard, sexual matters in the narrower sense are only dealt with at the end of each book. Everything winds up in the bed. Ovid, however, stays true to his style and his prudence by avoiding any erotic overtones in this passage. The conclusion of the second book delves into the gratifying aspects of having multiple orgasms at once. Odi concubitus, canonotronc resolvent is a confession made by the poet that is somewhat out of character for a Roman. Hoc est, Kerpueri Tangara Morate Minus. Because of this, I'm not as interested in the love of boys. At the end of the third part, similar to the Kama Sutra, the sexual positions are declined, and from those positions, women are encouraged to choose the one that is most appropriate for them by giving careful regard to the proportions of their bodies. Ovid's recommendation that tall women should not straddle their lovers is exemplified at the expense of the tallest hero of the Trojan Wars. Ovid's recommendation that tall women should not straddle their lovers is exemplified at the expense of the tallest hero of the Trojan Wars. Because she was so tall, the daughter of Thebes, Andromache, who was married to Hector never mounted a horse. However, the term ours in the title should not be translated clinically as technique or as art in the sense of civilized refinement. Instead, it should be translated as textbook, which is the original and historical definition of the word. Instead of the dactylic hexameters that are more commonly associated with the didactic poetry, 
The Ars Amatoria is written in elegiac couplets, which is fitting given the subject matter of the poem. Reception The poem was such a commercial and critical success that its author penned a sequel to it called Remedia Amoris, Remedies for Love. At an early recitatio, however, it is recorded that S. Vivianus Rhesus, the Roman governor of Thracia, walked out in disgust. It is a questionable assumption to argue that the licentiousness of the Ars Amatoria was partially to blame for Ovid's demotion, banishment, by Augustus in the year 8 AD. This assumption appears to more accurately represent modern tastes than historical facts. For one thing, by the time of the relegation, the work had already been in circulation for eight years, and it postdates the Julian marriage laws by 18 years. Second, it is highly improbable that Augustus, after 40 years of unopposed reign in the purple, considered the poetry of Ovid to be a significant threat or even an embarrassment to his social programs. This is because Augustus had been in the purple unopposed for the previous 40 years. Thirdly, Ovid's statement from his exile by the Black Sea that his demotion was due to Carmen et error, which translates to a song and a mistake, is barely accepted for several different reasons. Legacy it is more likely that Ovid was involved in some way in the factional politics that were connected with the succession. Agrippa Postumus, Augustus' adopted son, and Vipsania Julia, Augustus' granddaughter, were both demoted around the same time. Ovid may have been caught up in these politics in some way. This would also explain why Ovid was not granted clemency when Augustus was succeeded by Tiberius, who was Agrippa's competitor for the throne. Since this is the case, it is quite probable that the Ars Amatoria was employed as an alibi for the relegation. It is not the first time, nor will it be the last time, that a crackdown on immorality has been used to conceal an embarrassing political secret. The Ars Amatoria was a publication that, at the time of its release, generated a significant amount of curiosity. Marshall's epigrams, on a smaller scale, use a similar framework of instructing readers on love as their subject matter. The Ars Amatoria, which has offered further information on the relationship between Ovid's poetry and more contemporary writings, has been a consistent source of inspiration for contemporary writers and has had a significant impact on the development of modern literature. Beginning in the second half of the 11th century, the Ars Amatoria was incorporated into the curricula of medieval schools. The Ars Amatoria had such a significant impact on the literary production of Europe during the 12th and 13th centuries that the German medievalist and paleographer Ludwig Traub gave the entire age the name Itis Ovidiana, the Ovidian epoch. Throughout history, the Ars Amatoria has been the target of moral outrage, just as it was in the years immediately after the publication of the work. In the year 1497, Savonarola ordered that all of Ovid's works be destroyed in Florence, Italy. In the year 1930, the United States Customs Service seized an English translation of the Ars Amatoria. Despite the efforts taken against the work, it is still studied in Latin literary classes taught in colleges and universities. How was the video? Did you enjoy it? Post your feedback in our comments section below and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more updates.